You're listening to Romancing in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. Hello, and welcome to the Romancing in Paris podcast. I'm your host, Lily Heisey. In this podcast, we'll be traveling around the city as I pick out my top romantic spots per arrondissement. You don't have to visit these places only as a couple. Exploring them can be the expression of your own love of Paris. Are you ready to get romancing in Paris? Hello, and thank you for joining me for this new episode of Romancing in Paris. In the last episode, we visited the beautiful Parc Monceau in the 8th arrondissement. So today, we're hopping over into the 9th district. Found in the center of the right bank, the 9th mightn't be the most beautiful of Paris's 20 districts. However, it does have a number of perfectly romantic spots. In our first tour around the arrondissements, we visited the seductive bar of the chic Maison Souquet Boutique Hotel, and we discussed a little bit of the history of the Ninth, especially its racy side. If you haven't listened to that episode, I suggest you go back and check it out. Today we'll be visiting another spot intrinsically linked to the history of the district, and one which makes for an ideal romantic outing. Grab your sherry. We're going to the Musée Gustave Moreau. Now, the Ninth is home to but a few museums, and some listeners might be wondering why we aren't visiting what sounds like the district's most romantic museum, Le Musée de la Vie Romantique, or the Museum of Romantic Life. In this case, the term romantic wasn't chosen due to the venue's atmosphere, but rather in reference to the Romantic Era, an intellectual and artistic movement in Europe during the first half of the 19th century, which was indeed inspired by romance. While this museum is lovely and a fascinating place, which also has a very nice courtyard cafe, I think the Gustave Moreau Museum offers more romantic appeal, while also stepping back right into the heyday of the district, then referred to as La Nouvelle Athènes, or New Athens. For decades, it was the heart of intellectual, artistic, and sensual Paris. You might like to visit both of these museums during the same outing, as they're not far away from each other. Either way, we'll likely pop by the Musée de la Vie Romantique in a future season of the podcast. Now... Back to the site at hand. Set a little back from the other buildings on Rue de la Rochefoucauld is the former home and art studio of Gustave Moreau, one of the most significant painters of the symbolist movement of the second half of the 19th century. The elegant private mansion is home to a vast collection of art by this eccentric artist, whose seductive paintings often feature lovers. Before we visit the museum, let me give you a little more information about Moreau, which, to my pleasant surprise, involves some romantic intrigue. Moreau was born in Paris in 1826 into an upper-middle-class and cultural family, his father an architect and his mother a musician. At age eight, Moreau began drawing, a passion which he continued throughout his life. When Gustave was 15, his family took a trip to Italy, an experience which greatly marked the budding artist as he was completely absorbed by the art found in the country's major museums and art galleries. He filled a 60-page album with drawings, 
and the trip solidified his desire to pursue a career as an artist. Indeed, upon returning from Italy, he took evening drawing lessons, and his dedication eventually earned him a place at the École des Beaux-Arts, the Paris Fine Arts Academy. Things seemed like they were going on the right artistic track for Moreau. However, he did not end up completing his studies at the Academy. Based on his disappointment at not being selected for the prestigious Grand Prix de Rome, which included a year studying in the Eternal City, he dropped out, but kept practicing his craft by copying paintings in the Louvre. He was drawn to Romanticism, which was a prevalent style at the time, and showed a particular interest in the works of contemporary artist Eugène Delacroix, whom we discussed in episode 6 of the podcast, and Théodore Chazerot, both of whom lived and worked in the Nouvelle Athènes neighbourhood. Moreau developed a friendship with Chazerot, seven years his senior, and found a studio near his. Moreau even copied the elder artist's dandy lifestyle and could be found at the opera or at intellectual salons, mingling with Parisian society. In 1853, Moreau's father bought the mansion on Rue de la Rochefoucauld and had the top floor converted into a studio for his son. Gustave and his parents spent the rest of their lives living in this stylish dwelling. From 1857 to 1859, Moreau returned to Italy, a trip during which he made hundreds of copies and studies from old master paintings. Back in France, his own works started garnering attention, and his 1864 painting, Oedipus and the Sphinx, actually won a medal at the revered Paris Art Salon. His successes continued. On a personal front, as the years went by, Moreau grew increasingly reclusive and spent much of his time within the confines of the family mansion. He also became reticent to sell his artwork, which is probably why there is such a good collection here at his museum. Moreau did come out of his shell a bit when his friend Elie de Delaunay died in 1891, and he agreed to take over Delaunay's studio at the École des Beaux-Arts. It turned out that Moreau was a natural teacher, and his students included several who went on to become famous artists in their own right such as Henri Matisse and Georges Rouault, both of whom absolutely loved Moreau as a teacher. In fact, Moreau went against the traditional norms of teaching and took his students to the Louvre to copy from the masters, just as he himself had done in his own youth. He also invited his students to come around his studio on Rue de la Rochefoucauld and sometimes stop by theirs like in this occasion vividly described by Belgian fauvist artist Henri Evan Paul, which I will read to you. Yesterday, at half past one, I was walking along the embankment when I met Gustave Moreau, who, like myself, was on his way to see a good chum of mine, Henri Matisse, a delicate painter, skilful in the art of using greys. He suffers from violent neuralgia in his arm and can hardly walk. Somehow or other, we reached the Quai Saint-Michel, where Matisse was strolling about waiting for him. We made our way painfully up the stairs of that old house at number 19. There we were at last in the small studio, full of torn wallpaper and knickknacks, all grey with dust. Moreau said to me, We are the jury. He sat down in an armchair with me beside him, and we spent a delightful hour. He told us the whys and the wherefores of his likes and dislikes. Matisse showed us his entries for the Champ de Mars exhibition. 
some ten canvases with beautiful colors, practically all of them still lifes, and they provided the starting point for talking about everything connected with art, including music. Moreau has remained astonishingly young. There is nothing professional about him, not a hint of pedantry. He is a friend. Well, isn't that nice how Moreau had left such an impact and had a friendly relationship with his students? However, was that the only type of relationship Moreau had? Hmm... If you're enjoying this episode of Romancing in Paris, you may be interested in our sister podcast, Don't Miss This. It comes out every Sunday and has a fabulous roundup of the best and coolest events taking place in Paris during the week. Romancing in Paris will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Romancing in Paris. Moreau never married, something which previously led biographers to suspect that he was a homosexual. However, more recent research has revealed a relationship with a certain Adelaide Alexandrine Durot, whom he met shortly after returning from Italy, and whom he remained close to over the next 30 years. Proven in letters and other documents, Moreau was very fond of Alexandrine, whom he called his best and only friend. Um, a close friend indeed. For Moreau put up the schoolteacher, who went by her second first name, Alexandrine, in an apartment near the family home. He gave her drawing lessons and made a number of paintings for her even some romantic caricatures of the two of them walking on clouds. Oh, la, la, Gustave. Apparently, their relationship was only known of by their closest circle of friends. His mother knew of it, and even stipulated in her own will that an annuity be provided for Alexandrine if Gustave died before her. Gustave even designed Alexandrine's tombstone, which was engraved with their interlaced initials, A and G, and is located near the family plot in the Montmartre Cemetery. So, if he was that smitten with Alexandrine, why didn't they simply get married? Well, Moreau felt that marriage and founding a family killed artists, and he wanted to dedicate himself to his art. I hope that Alexandrine was content enough with their arrangement. Alexandrine died before Moreau. Perhaps this is why he ended up taking up teaching to fill the void her passing had left. In those last years, Moreau, left without direct heirs, decided to bequeath his mansion and collection to the French state, with the objective of it becoming a museum. Therefore, even during his lifetime, he remodeled his townhouse, expanding the small studio on the top floor into what would then become a much larger exhibition space. His health began declining, and Moreau passed away from stomach cancer in 1898. He left firm instructions that his death was not to be announced in the press, and for his funeral to be small. Instead of flowers put on his grave, he wanted any which were received to be placed on Alexandrine's instead. His museum, containing a collection of around 1,200 paintings and watercolors, and over 10,000 drawings, was originally curated by his former student, Georges Rouault, and opened to the public in 1903, making it one of France's first art studio museums. I think it's about time we pop by for a visit, don't you think? The 
The four-storied building has three different ambiances. The ground floor houses six rooms which overlook the garden. Here you'll find Moreau's drawings and sketches of Italian masters. Moving up to the first floor are more intimate rooms, the family's private apartments. Walking through their dining room, a bedroom, den, and office library, which are decorated in family heirlooms and Louis XVI-style furniture, grants a little window into the personal life of the artist, as well as into 19th-century bourgeois society. The second and third floors, separated by a superb spiral staircase, are two large studio spaces which display the artist's major works and are the highlight of the museum. Moreau frequently painted allegories, biblical and mythological subjects. The lofty, mysterious, and intriguing works do add an extra layer of romance to your visit. After you've viewed the larger paintings, one of the most fun things to do at the museum, and as a couple, is to peruse the secret drawers and cabinets. These are populated with drawings of nymphs and mythological gods and goddesses, which are oh so very evocative. Perhaps Alexandrine herself, or Gustave's affection for her, inspired some of these works? Indeed, while you're visiting, look out for some references to her, or objects Gustave made for her, like a beautiful fan called La Paris. All these romantic and sensual imagery sets the perfect prelude for more romancing in the ninth. Perhaps skip out on the Romantic Life Museum and go straight to La Maison Souquet for a seductive drink, or to one of the other cool cocktail bars found in the ninth. See my website, Je t'aime me neither, for more information on these, as well as countless other date ideas in Paris and beyond. Thank you for listening to this latest episode of Romancing in Paris. If you have a minute, please rate or review it. It only takes a moment and is extremely helpful in attracting potential new listeners. If you would like to support the network, please see our Patreon page, which includes fantastic extras for its members. Until next time, happy Romancing in Paris! This episode of Romancing in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.